I want to begin our lesson today with a reading from Mark chapter 5, verse 21. We've been reading the Gospels, the Synoptic Gospels, in our daily Bible reading as a part of our daily Bible reading for 2024. Mark chapter 5, verse 21, beginning. And when Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered about him, and he was beside the sea. Then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, and seeing him, he fell down at his feet and implored him earnestly, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and alive. And he went with him, and a great crowd followed him and thronged about him. And there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for 12 years and who had suffered much under many physicians and had spent all that she had and was no longer better, but rather grew worse. She had heard the reports about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if I even touch his garment, I will be made well. The events of Mark 5 might very well be the some of the most fascinating found within a single chapter of Jesus' earthly ministry. We didn't read it, but the beginning of this chapter details Jesus' experience with the man possessed by the demon called Legion, Mark chapter 5, verse 1. 1 through 9, and we know very well that um, that amazing story in which the demon pleaded with Jesus that he might be cast out into the herd of pigs that ran down the mountainside and into the sea where they drowned. And if we thought that was the most amazing and perplexing thing in the chapter, well, we just need to keep on reading the rest of the chapter. From there, we see Jesus going back over to the other side of the sea where he was met by this synagogue official named Jairus, and he came to fall at the feet of Jesus, begging him that he might come and heal his little daughter who was at the point of death. Jesus agrees to go with this man to his house so that his daughter might be healed, and on the way they find themselves being surrounded by a great crowd of people. During the commotion of, G of, Jerry, of Jesus and the others is trying to squeeze their way through the crowd, a sick woman pushes her way through the crowd in order to just touch the garment of Jesus. This woman herself was extremely sick and had been so for 12 years. The text tells us that she had been suffering from a blood hemorrhage. So certainly this uh, would have been physically, mentally, and even spiritually exhausting to this woman dealing with this for such a lengthy time. Her options for healing were also exhausted for her. She had spent much time and money and effort seeking out doctors who could help her condition. This woman was, in fact, desperate. But she was not the only desperate individual in this chapter. Not only was she desperate for healing from her, for her condition, but so was Jairus. He was desperate for his little girl to be healed, but so was the demon-possessed man. He was desperate to find reprieve from his demons, and he was blessed that Jesus happened to pass by his place of residence in the caves. What we have in Mark chapter 5 is Jesus and the desperate. These people were at the end of their rope. They had nowhere else to turn but to Jesus. So let's use our time of study in this lesson, focusing on that idea of desperate turning to Jesus and look at how it applies even today. 
And at this lesson, we've entitled Jesus and the Desperate, a part of our daily Bible reading for 2024, where we have read the Gospel of John and we are now reading the Synoptic Gospels and so many treasures that we find of Jesus' earthly ministry contained in these Gospels to help us get to know Jesus better this year and to grow mighty and prevail. First of all, the most desperate people we find in the Word of God sought out Jesus throughout His ministry. The most desperate of people continuously sought out Jesus. We find that. The desperate of Mark chapter 5 come to Jesus, but this is not the only time we see such a thing happening. Here in Mark 5, we see Jairus coming to Jesus so that he might heal his daughter, which he does even though things got a little scary there at the end for Jairus with his daughter dying before they were able to arrive and we find this in Mark chapter 5, verse 21 through 24 and 35 through 42. We also see this woman coming to Jesus so that she could be made well just by touching his garment. And she is immediately made well through doing this seemingly minuscule thing of touching his garment. The friends of the lame man in Luke chapter 5, verse 17, were so desperate for Jesus' healing of their friend that they put in a great amount of work and effort in order to lower him down through the roof to where they might reach Jesus. Their effort paid off because Jesus did heal the man. The centurion of Luke chapter 7 and verses 1 through 10, loved and highly valued his servant who had become deathly ill, and he sought out Jesus so that he might be healed. And Jesus did heal him without even stepping foot in the centurion's house. These are just four examples of numerous individuals who came to Jesus seeking for help in their most desperate times of need. Not only were they all desperate, but they also had in common the fact that they believed Jesus could truly help them. All these people sought out Jesus because they believed that he could aid them in their greatest needs. Notice these examples again. What it is stated by Jesus and the inspired writers, Jairus surely believed in the power of Jesus because he, he stated as much. When he first came to Jesus, he says in Mark chapter 5 and in verse 23, my little daughter is at the point of death. Please come and lay your hands on her so that she might be made well. Even after he received the news that his daughter had died, Jesus sought to reinforce that faith by belief, by telling Jairus, he says, do not be afraid any longer, only believe. Mark chapter 5. And in verse 36, all these people sought out Jesus because they believed that he could aid them in their greatest of needs. Faith also played roles in the healing of the lame man and the servant of the centurion. In Luke chapter 5 and verse 20, we see Luke recording that it was the faith of the friends that made such an impact on Jesus that was that he was willing to heal their friend of his inability to walk additionally Jesus said of the centurion in Mark chapter 7 and verse 9 not even in Israel have I found such great faith the commonality between all these people was the fact that they were in desperate situation and they all came to Jesus with the belief that he had the power to do something about it. How nice it would have been if all people would have responded to Jesus 
in such a way. However, not all people sought out Jesus because not all people saw themselves as being desperate. As far as individuals go, the first person who comes to mind as a person who didn't see the need for Jesus was the rich young ruler of Mark chapter 10 and verse 17 through 22. He originally came to Jesus seeking to know what needed to be done in order to have eternal life. He seemed to believe that Jesus had the answers, but he ended up going away sorrowfully. I also think of the crowds that left Jesus and followed him no more in John chapter 6, verse 60 through 66. Jesus had spoken important truths to those individuals concerning himself being the bread of life sent down from heaven, but they were not willing to listen to his strong teaching any longer, and a great many of them stopped following Jesus at this point. And then, of course, there are the Pharisees and other Jews who didn't see Jesus as being someone worthy of following. They continually caused problems for Jesus. They refused to even give him a fair consideration at times. So often, we find Jesus' interaction with these people ending up with them trying to kill Jesus. One such occurrence can be found in John chapter 8 and verse 59. But why was it that these people had such polar opposite reactions to Jesus compared to those who we've already looked at? I'll suggest it's because these people didn't see themselves as being desperate for what Jesus had to offer. Not all people saw Jesus offering something they needed. The text in Mark chapter 10 and verse 22 explicitly tells us that the young man went away sorrowfully because he owed much property. Jesus had told him to go sell what he had and give it to the poor. This man might have made it seem as if he was in need of the last piece, but the reality was that he felt like he had everything he could ever want in his possessions, and they were more important than the eternal life that Jesus was trying to offer him through total discipleship. Additionally, the crowds of John chapter 6 refused to see Jesus as the true bread of life that had been sent down from heaven. They acted as if they truly wanted the bread of life, John chapter 6 and verse 34. But once Jesus declared himself as the bread of life, well, they quickly lost interest. Their attitude and mindset toward Jesus is summed up well in what Peter said once, to, once Jesus asked his closest disciple. And they too were going to leave. And the Lord asked Peter, was he going to leave? Peter says, you have the words of eternal life. We have believed and come to know that you are the Holy One of God, Peter said. The rest of the people failed to believe as the disciples believed. Finally, the Jews of John 8 refused to come to Jesus for what he was offering because they didn't see themselves as in need of the freedom that Jesus was offering. Notice what they said in John chapter 8, verse 33. They said, we are Abraham's descendants and have never yet been enslaved to anyone. Abraham, they said in verse 39, is our father. These men didn't see themselves as being in need of the freedom that Jesus was providing because they leaned upon the fact that they were bloodline relatives and descendants of Abraham. And as such, they believed they had everything already figured out. But we know that this most certainly wasn't the case for as long as Jesus goes on to say, as Jesus goes on to say in John chapter 8 and verse 44, he said, you are of your father the devil 
and you want to do the desires of your father. That's what he tells them here. They refuse what Jesus offered when in reality they were in the most desperate need of freedom from the bondage of being enslaved to the devil and his wicked deeds. And so we are in desperate need for the remedy of that Jesus offers, and that is the remedy for sin. We desperately need that today. Before we even talk about our problem of sin, we need to recognize that we ought to observe the same behavior of the good examples we have already looked at. We need that behavior. We need to behave like that. Like Jairus, the sick woman, the friends of the lame man, and the centurion. We must recognize what Jesus is offering and make a habit of constantly going to God when we face the difficulties of life. This life is hard enough as it is when we consider the difficulties that we often face in sickness, loss, and everyday problems that we endure. If we truly believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, then we must be a people who constantly go to Him in prayer. In 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 7, Peter says, casting all your anxiety on Him because He cares for you. While Jesus might not be offering the laying on of hands and the power of supernatural healings as he did so personally in the first century, Jesus is still offering comfort and hope for those who struggle at the hands of life's difficulties. The aid he offers us today is the hope of glory in the next life. He offers us comfort. Notice that he offers us comfort there. As we look at this in our Romans chapter 8 and in verse 38, he says in this passage, For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers, he says, nor what's he going to say? nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything, he says, else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. This hope is available to all of those who have gone to Jesus for help with their greatest desperate need in this life. Help to be cured from the curse of sin. Jesus' greatest aid in this life is to cleanse those who are in desperate need for, for the stain of sin to be erased from their souls. What ought to be recognized as one of the most beautiful portions of scriptures is found in the text that we open in our assembly. From Romans chapter 5 and in verse 6, he says, For while we were still weak at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For he says, No one, watch this, for no one, he says, will scarcely die for a righteous man. Though perhaps for a good person, one would dare even to die. Verse 8, But God showed His love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by His blood, much more shall we be saved by Him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more now that we are reconciled shall we be saved by His life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Jesus' greatest aid 
in this life is to cleanse those who are in desperate need for the stain of sin to be erased from their lives. Notice that Paul declares that all of those who have sinned are helpless. In Romans chapter 5 and in verse 6 through 9, he pointed that out to us in what we read just a few minutes ago. Let's reiterate that we were in the most desperate situations. Our decisions to sin caused us to become enemies of God. He w would have just, and rightfully so, he would have been just and rightfully so to wipe us out because of our transgressions against his will. But instead, he sought to allow his enemies to be reconciled back to him through the death of his son. That life given would allow for our lives to be saved through our throwing ourselves at his merciful feet and begging to be washed, cleansed, and sanctified through our own faith. That same faith that helped the desperate people of the New Testament to be added by Jesus is the same faith that will lead us to be cleansed in the name of of and by the power of Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus surely calls all those who are weary and heavy laden to come to him, as he says in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Two closing thoughts for you to think about. First of all, look at the faith of these people. Being a Christian was not a part-time consideration or a once-a-day-a-week a, once a commitment. Number two, Paul felt very close to these people, and he wanted them to feel the same closeness to each other. There is power and strength in Christian closeness. As we worship together, as we commune together, we can develop that closeness to one another. The Bible asked the question in Acts chapter 16, verse 30. The question was asked by the Philippian jailer, what must I do to be saved? The Bible reveals to us faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Romans chapter 10, verse 17. Hebrews 11, 6 tells us he who comes to God must believe that he is. He's the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Jesus said to them, I'm going away and you will not seek me and you will die in your sins. And where I go, you cannot come. Therefore, he says, I said to you that you will die in your sins. For if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Jesus told his disciples that very thing there that is impo important to understand in the plan of salvation. He now commands all men everywhere to repent, Acts 17, verse 30. Luke 13, 3 and 5, I tell you, no, unless you believe, you will all likewise perish. With the mouth, confession is made unto salvation, Romans 10, 10. Then we learn we're to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. He says, do you not know in Romans chapter 6 and verse 3, do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so, he says, even so, we also should walk in newness of life. There's the plan of salvation for the alien sinner. But we also learn that God has conditions for salvation for the Christian. What's the Christian to do? The Bible tells us that the Christian is to remain faithful. He who endures to the end will be saved. We learn that in Matthew chapter 10, 
verse 22. Revelation 2.10, we're to be faithful unto death and we'll receive the crown of life. Well, what if the Christian sins? The Bible talks about that too. If the Christian sins, we learn in Acts the eighth chapter of a man named Simon the sorcerer, a magician. And we learn that he was told when he was baptized and wanted to buy the power of the laying on of hands, he was told that your money perish with you. He says, to repent, therefore, of this your wickedness, Acts chapter 8 and verse 22. He was told to repent, change his life, change the way his thinking, change his attitude about the gospel as something to make money off of. Then we learn if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins, 1 John 1 and verse 9. But notice in Acts chapter 8 and verse 22, the rest of what Simon the sorcerer was told, not only was told to repent, therefore this is wickedness, but he says, and pray to God if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you. There's what we must do to be saved, both as an alien sinner and then as a child of God, we're to remain faithful. But when we sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, His Son. We're to repent of our sin. We're to confess Jesus. We're to confess our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. That is a child of God. And then we're to pray God to forgive us the thought and intent of our heart. And so that is the plan of salvation to the alien sinner and to the child of God when he sins. If you found this video helpful and want to learn more, be sure you write for our free four lesson Bible correspondence course. We here at the Spring Hill Church of Christ want to help in your growth in the knowledge of God's holy word. Also, remember, we are in it for the likes and the subs, so be sure you subscribe, like us, and follow us on YouTube, Facebook, Rumble, and Twitter, or what is now called X. Thanks for watching or listening, and so with that, in the meantime, in between time, we will see you next time. Cheerio, mate. Bob's your uncle.